Hello everybody, this is Peter Swidler with a recap video of round 7 of the Berlin Candidates Tournament and once again a round with a very easy uh, game to choose. Uh, I will be covering the game that uh, Levon Aronian played against uh, Fabiano Caruana. A very very exciting game and a very difficult game to uh, understand properly so many of the things I will be showing you are uh, at best preliminary results of uh, some analysis um, Jan and, uh, and I have done once the round was over, which uh, if, you, if you have seen the round you will understand that we were somewhat exhausted by that point. But uh, we tried to at least get some feel of the very unusual and non-standard positions that occur at some around move 20 in this game and uh, let's, get, uh, let's get to the actual moves. Um, left played uh, d4, to which Fabiano replied with knight f6, c4, e6, knight, c3, knight f3, uh, d5, uh, knight c3, and d takes c4 has been played here by Fabiano, which is an interesting choice. Not that Vienna is such a surprising uh, decision. Uh, there has already been a Vienna game uh, in this tournament. Somewhat relevantly, uh, Levon himself played it with black and won a reasonably easy game against Sergei Karekin, who misplayed the opening quite poorly. And uh, the noticeable part about this, this move is that Levon himself went for the Vienna via via this move order. And uh, taking on c4 uh, on move 4 generally is considered to be these days somewhat inferior because after e4 and bishop b4, which is what happened in this game, white has a very important additional option of playing bishop takes c4, knight takes e4 and castles. There is a reasonably large body of theory by this point connected with this line and it's supposed to be uh, quite, th quite threatening. I'm not a particularly large expert on it, if I'm honest, but uh, Jan insists uh, on this being a very, very serious attempt uh, to get an opening advantage. And in fact, uh, during the live broadcast, Jan uh, felt very surprised that Levon decided to go for main lines and played bishop g5. And uh, we were about to start discussing uh, whether Lev will finally show us uh, what to do in the main lines after c5 having uh, won a game against Karekin in, in that precise position, when uh, Fabiano went to h6 here, which is a well-known but uh, relatively uh, less explored uh, sideline of the Vienna. And uh, the game uh, very quickly followed uh, bishop takes f6, queen takes f6, bishop c4, c5, castles, cd4, e5. This is all reasonably well-known, and there have been uh, a number of uh, recent high-profile games starting from this position, uh, including a game between Dinglier and, and uh, Aronian himself with the black pieces in the World Cup final in Belize 2017. Queen d8 is the main move in this position, knight e4, castles and queen e2, and perhaps it is time to discuss a little bit the plans of the sides and what generally tends to happen in these positions. Uh, the pawn on d4 is... Uh, well, black currently has an extra pawn and a central pawn in that, but the play generally doesn't revolve around white trying to win it back, although occasionally, of course, uh, this will become a topic. But mainly, white has a very simplistic plan of playing something like bishop d3, knight g3, queen e4, creating a threat of queen h7 mate, trying to provoke black to play g7, g6, and then some kind of plans with h4 and h5, Actually, uh, in many cases, white will develop a very, very serious initiative on the king's side. And uh, the fact that the pawn is on d4, if anything, works to uh, make sure that nothing gets traded along the, uh, the central files, because it, it serves as a, usual, uh, as a useful cover for the bishop on d3, so that nothing can attack it. Um, Lev himself played bishop d7 in this position, uh, against Ding, rook fd1, knight c6, uh, knight g3, bishop c5, and in this position Ding, went, uh, Ding made one inaccurate move. If I remember correctly what was being said after the game, a2, a3 is already a serious inaccuracy, and after uh, knight e7, uh, black had a very pleasant position, and uh, Lev was soon uh, close to being technically winning in that game. But 
uh, Fabiano decided to deviate from the moves that left himself uh, made in this position and played bishop e7. This is also not unheard of, but it's a much rarer move which uh, is only now gaining in popularity and there has been a very recent game uh, played in the Bundesliga between Niels Grandelius and uh, 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 Bluebaum and uh, that game I think was played uh, during the last Bundesliga weekend which finished about a week ago. The point of this move, as all these beautiful arrows are, are indicating, is that Black is now reserving the option of developing this knight from b8 to d7 and not c6, which could eventually lead it to be placed on f8. I will show you this motif later, without, <laughs> not with arrows, but with moves on the board. And in this way, Black uh, is aiming to uh, counter White's ideas of bishop d3, knight g3, queen e4 by placing the knight on f8 and protecting the h7 square without ever committing the move g7, g6, which gives white additional targets on the king's side. Um, Lev's reply was played incredibly fast, and we were uh, debating in the studio whether this is home prep or not, because uh, rook ad1, whilst being a perfectly natural move, does seem a little bit less obvious than rook fd1, which is, for instance, what Niels Grandelius played against Bluebaum, because generally the rooks are placed on d1 and c1 in these lines. The game followed queen a5, knight g3, rook d8, queen e4, knight d7, bishop d3, knight f8, exactly as, as I described. And after a very, very sharp fight, it was uh, the game was eventually drawn. Rook a d1 uh, uh, was, as mentioned, played by Lev. And here, uh, uh, Fabiano played queen c7, uh, which potentially is just an outright novelty, but once again, it, it follows very logically from what I was saying. Black, whilst keeping an eye on the e5 pawn, is mainly just pre preparing to go rook d8, knight d7, knight f8 in many cases. And once again, he is not really giving white too many hints about uh, where this knight on b8 will be developed. Uh, uh, left played bishop d3, knight d7, and here... Uh, after some thought, Lev went for an incredibly interesting uh, speculative uh, uh, pawn sacrifice, and you have to keep in mind that one pawn has already been sacrificed up to this point. Instead of uh, what would be the, the absolutely normal normal move here, knight g3, to which black can reply in two ways. You can either go rook g8, queen e4, knight f8, once again, achieving the same setup that we were discussing for the past uh, five minutes, but also there is, a, there is an additional option here for black, which also deserves attention. You can play knight c5, uh, attacking the bishop on d3. Without this bishop on d3, white's attack on the king side will be a lot weaker, obviously, because it's a lot harder to even provoke any kind of a weakness. And after bishop b1, black can play d3. And uh, this probably means that the bishop will finally have to get traded, because if you play something like queen a3, queen e3, black can play a5, and this is a, a very important setup, which secures uh, the, the knight on c5 from any kind of b2-b4 attacks and makes sure that white, if he wants to win this pawn back, probably has to play bishop d3. And as mentioned, this is immediately uh, a lot easier for black to handle uh, when this bishop uh, disappears off the board. Instead of all this, left played queen c1, 5 replied by the very natural move knight a5, oh, sorry, queen a5, and here, once again, there is nothing particularly wrong with playing knight g3, to which black can reply by either rook g8. And here, um, I tried clicking this around a little bit, and perhaps instead of queen e4, which often just gets in the way, white could try saving some tempi by going knight h5, and if knight f8, not even going queen uh, e4 at all, at all, but playing knight g2, bringing this knight over to c4, the queen to g4, and mounting a very serious attack like this. Uh, but once again, after knight g3, as in the previous note, black has the option of going knight c5. The difference being that in this position, white actually has the immediate uh, exchange sacrifice with rook takes c5 if he wants. Um, obviously, you can still go bishop b1, d3, and queen e3, but these positions, once again, after queen b5, appear to be perfectly fine for black at the very least. Rook takes c5 is an interesting uh, exchange sacrifice, but it appears to only lead to a draw after queen takes. Queen e4, g6, queen f4, knight, king g7. And 
and white could try building some kind of a slow attack here, but I don't think black is black has really done much wrong to uh, be very fearful of some kind of a slow plan with h4, h5. But there is an immediate draw with knight h5 check, uh, gh, queen g3 check, king h8, queen f4, and black has nothing better than a repetition. And black is also not better after king h7. In fact, after knight f6 here, white could maybe consider uh, playing on. So I think uh, this sacrifice has to be accepted, and then there is a, an immediate repetition in the draw. But none of this happened, and uh, the move that uh, Levon played here, g2, g4, uh, prompted some people to, to even ask whether this was some kind of an over-the-board misclick, because it just looks so bizarre. The pawn on e5 is hanging, and white replies, uh, replies to it by starting some kind of a pawn storm. Uh, but uh, even if objectively uh, black is doing very well after this, it's an extremely uh, interesting and a very fresh idea. Uh, and uh, we should be grateful for, for Levon for trying to create uh, a very non-standard, very sharp position. Out, instead of uh, blindly continuing the sort of the accepted, the accepted plan of uh, knight g3 and queen e4, the pawn on e5 has to be taken. There are other moves available to black, but it's very very difficult to I think to restrict yourself from from taking this pawn. Uh, white takes and plays f4. This is of course the whole point of the sacrifice. The queen will have to go somewhere else, and then white starts. Uh, uh, attacking the pawn on h6 with g5. Without this target, of course, none of this would have been even remotely possible, but with the pawn on h6 uh, presenting uh, uh, the usual hook on the king side, which you can use with g4, g5, black needs to be quite careful. Uh, queen d5 is not a horrible move, but uh, I liked queen a5 a lot better during the, the live broadcast, and it is objectively, I think, the best move in the position. g5 followed, and uh, in this position, uh, Fabiano finally uh, decided to think for quite some time, and uh, I don't really like his decision very much because I couldn't really understand why he couldn't play in a lot in a lot more natural fashion. But I guess he uh, was trying to safeguard against uh, potential bailout opportunities from White. The two moves that we were discussing immediately once we saw this position on the board with Jan during the live broadcast were g6, which is very, very natural, uh, creating seemingly a very strong idea of h5, and asking white if he wants to take on h6, after which, uh, well, you can make any kind of developing move here. It's In general, the inclusion of uh, g6 and gh makes black's choices a lot easier, because now you, just knowing what you have to deal with on the king side, uh, is, a, is a large advantage here for black. And you can play king h8, you can play king h7, there's any number of moves that you, can, you might want to make in this position. Black is quite comfortable. But when I looked at this position uh, preparing for, for this video, uh, I noticed that after h4, which originally uh, the computer doesn't like very much, the position becomes incredibly messy. Um, if you try developing slowly and playing something like bishop d7, white goes h5, and here white probably is no longer even worse. There's a very, very serious attack going on on the king's side. There is a move e6, e5 that the computer suggests might be quite strong, but uh, playing like this really is uh, very, very uncomfortable for a human being. Uh, for instance, there is the move b4, which distracts the queen from e5, and the position becomes a huge mess. Queen takes b4, f5. Uh, black probably is objectively better here, but uh, making a move like this is not easy in a practical game. And the most natural reply to h4, which is h5, actually leads to very unclear positions. White goes knight g3, and basically just takes on h5 against any move. Black can continue ignoring it by something like rook a c8, but then rook c1, and as I mentioned, this construction with a pawn on d uh, d4 and a bishop on d3 uh, means that it's actually not that easy for black to mount any kind of uh, reasonable counterplay in the center because white controls uh, all of the entrance squares on the c-file, the d-file is closed, and that means that the knife will just return to g3, white will play h4, h5, and objectively black is probably better here, but it's not 
from a human perspective, this is not a, 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 a clear position uh, at all. But the move that I was advocating for the most, I, I still believe was the strongest in this position, and that's the move bishop d7. And it's difficult for me to understand why Fabiano decided against it, because uh, as long as the pawn doesn't really uh, appear on uh, g6, white doesn't threaten much by playing h4. Uh, although you will see that white will occasionally play h4 in these positions, but uh, it's very important for black to start uh, getting his pieces out, and tempi, tempi obviously will matter a great deal in positions like this. So creating the idea of playing rook c8, bishop c6 is, is very important and should be done as early as possible. White can play uh, b2, b4 here, trying to distract black from his moves, and queen takes b4, rook b1 is indeed not very clear at all, but you can play queen d8 after b4, and uh, what you get here is basically the same position players got in the game, but with an extra tempo for black, because uh, the inclusion of b4 and bishop d7 has to be uh, quite seriously in black's favor. Queen g8 is generally a useful move, whereas b4 will be not that easy to justify. Perhaps Fabiano didn't like g takes h6, black generally replies by playing uh, g6 here, and in this position, there is this tactical shot, knight c5, which objectively probably is the strongest move in the position. Bishop takes, queen e5, you have to play f6, white takes, you take, and white takes, and it seems like this position is not very, very clear. But black is, in fact, better even after something like rook ac8, and black is significantly better if he goes for king h7, rook c7, rook f7, rook takes b7, and now you can unpin yourself by playing bishop e8, and uh, you will still have to play quite precisely here to, uh, to be much better with black. But in general, eventually these pawns will start rolling, and, and then uh, the, black, uh, the extra pawn black currently has here will be quite keenly felt. It, this, is, this is an unpleasant position for white. White is uh, faced with a very, very difficult fight for, for a draw here. He is uh, going to be much worse for the rest of the game. So it would be curious for me to, to find out why Fabiano decided not to make this move. It, it is by far, I think, the most natural move in the position, and I'm pretty sure he wanted to make it, because your hand just uh, reaches for the bishop to connect the rooks to start developing your pieces. Instead of all that, Fabi played uh, queen g8, and this position is in fact very, very unclear. Uh, h4 is the best move in the position, and kudos Kudos to uh, Lev for finding and making it, because it, it seems like it's incredibly slow. But this is the correct approach, not because you're protecting the g5 pawn, but because you're creating the idea of g takes h6 and h5. Black has a number of moves he can make here. For instance, something like king h8 would not have been out of the question. It may have been actually a pretty decent move. But it's hard uh, to blame Fabiano for playing bishop d7, because it is uh, the way you would like to develop your pieces in this position gh, g6, uh, other moves are a lot less clear, h5. In the press conference, I believe, Levon uh, expressed uh, regret that instead of h5 he didn't play knight g5. But once again, when you ask the machine about this position, it says that after king h8 there really isn't uh, very much black needs to be worried about, queen e5 check is never really a huge threat. And uh, black will eventually consolidate. Uh, uh, the machine gives black a significant advantage in this position, uh, despite the somewhat threatening setup white has on the king side. So h5, I believe, is a correct decision. King h8. But from this position onwards, Lev made uh, a couple of decisions which uh, you have to say were not optimal. And I really wonder what they were motivated uh, by, because... I have a very strong suspicion that uh, he knew that he can, uh, he will be perfectly fine if he takes on g6 and just goes knight c5 here. Uh, black pretty much has to take this knight, it's uh, uh, too strong of a piece. And then this rook, as you can see from the arrows, the rook is headed towards g5, queen e5 is always a very decent idea. And even if white has to trade some pieces, uh, with his other pieces as active as this, uh, this should be a reasonably uh, reasonably trivially holdable position for white. But my suspicion is that Lev uh, just wasn't very interested in, in anything that 
looked like it might have uh, equality as it's same. And uh, HGFG 9C5 does, of course, also make Black's life a lot easier by eliminating many of the threats and uh, uh, offering, in some cases, mass exchanges of pieces. Which is why Lev played uh, King H2, uh, keeping the position as complicated as possible. But even if you wanted to do that, something like Queen G2 may have been a better choice. Uh, perhaps hinting at knight e4 g5 later on. King h2 is a bit of a nothing move, which doesn't really create any threats, and it's not obvious uh, what you're even trying to achieve by, by making this move. But it doesn't really ruin the game in, uh, at all. The position remains very unclear, even if uh, the machine at this point starts liking black uh, better than white. But the next move uh, definitely is a mistake. In this position, it's already difficult to play correctly with white, but rook f2 followed by rook g1 would still have led to very, very unclear positions. Um, compared to the game, uh, if black makes the same move uh, as uh, Fabiano did in, uh, made in the game, you, can, you have to play king h3, which looks very awkward, but you need to stop the threat of queen h4. And after bishop c7, rook g1, white does achieve what appears to be an ideal setup. And uh, this position becomes very, very sharp and very, very unclear, and not worse for white at all. The best move after rook f2, according to the machine, is something like queen a5 or queen d5. And without going too much into detail, uh, you're probably not going to do very well in this position if you are playing against the computer. But that is true about many positions, I would say most positions. But in a practical game between two human beings, this would have been very much game on with all three results, uh, very, very possible. Instead, Levon played rook f3, and here Fabiano, uh, objectively, you have to say, committed a mistake because uh, a very, very natural move, queen d5, uh, would have been uh, immensely strong. I'm not entirely sure what he, what he missed here. I suspect maybe that after rook g3, he did not realize just how strong simple queen takes h5 is. White takes, takes, and seemingly rook g7 creates tremendous threats here. And, uh, and black, in fact, would have been completely lost, if not for uh, the fact that f7, f5 here just wins on the spot. You block down this uh, bishop on d3, attack the knight. If the knight goes to some non-forcing squares, black will just play bishop f6. And if you play knight g5, we take. And regardless of what you recapture with, for instance, f takes g, uh, rook g8, black has too many extra pawns for white to be able to do very much about it in this position. Uh, black will eventually win. Uh, after queen g5, uh, rook g3, as, as we've just seen, uh, pretty much loses. And if you play something like rook h3, your attack becomes very, very derailed because your pieces now are on very, very unfortunate squares. And something like rook g8 uh, absolutely secures the game for black. There's really no serious counterplay left, and I'm pretty sure uh, this position would have been convertible without... Uh, great, uh, any kind of great difficulty for Fabiano. But bishop d6 also looks like a sensible move, creating a large threat of uh, queen h4 check. Um, queen f2 was played. As a matter of fact, king h3, uh, the same as with the uh, rook f2, bishop d6, king h3 line, king h3 was objectively stronger, but it's very, very difficult to make moves like this in a practical game. Uh, and uh, once again, the computer suggests the position after uh, e5, f5, gf5, rook f5, and the move bishop d6, e7, e7 which is, uh, frankly, you, you don't play like this very often. Uh, having just played bishop e7, d6, to go back here would not have been an easy choice. And even here, for, from a human perspective, something like uh, rook cf1 or king h2 followed by rook cf1, or even the exchange sacrifice on c6. Uh, to me, this wouldn't have been obvious as a bad position for white, even though objectively it is rather bad. But king h3 was probably uh, a, a decent shot here for Lev, because queen f2, uh, the move that he played, doesn't really achieve very much. And uh, after bishop c7, he still felt uh, compelled to play king h3. 
This position is still uh, incredibly difficult to play though and uh, more mistakes are, are forthcoming. In this position uh, something like rook g8 once again was probably the strongest uh, the strongest move available to to black with perhaps uh, some ideas of bishop takes e4 followed by g6 g5 and uh, the machine even suggests uh, that you can play g6 takes h5 and, and this is a recurring theme here. Uh, this move, in in many cases, uh, further down uh, down the stretch as well, appears to be the strongest move available uh, to black. But it's not a move that would come uh, easily to, to to any human player because you instinctively feel that opening up any kinds of files in front of your in front of your king is a very very risky proposition. And there are some uh, somewhat outlandish uh, variations I could show you starting from this position, but. Let's just say gh5 is objectively a good move, but it's a move that it is very, very difficult to make in a practical game. Queen e7, which is what Fabiano played, is a lot is a lot easier to understand. Nobody really cares about the d4 pawn once again. Uh, taking on d4 and uh, prompting black to make a very strong move e6, e5 is really unthinkable. And black generally uh, gathers his pieces closer together, protects uh, some squares potentially for the future. The queen on e7 uh, might be able to, uh, once you play f7 and f5, maybe sometime, sometime later, might be able to control some important squares along the 7th. And it's a, it's a much more human and a much more natural move to make in this position, but uh, it's not the strongest. And had, had left made uh, what appears to be the most logical move in the position, rook g1, rook g8, and rook fg3, it is once again pretty much anybody's game. It's uh, very difficult to assess exactly what's going on. Uh, black could still be slightly better, but that's I think the extent, the extent of what black could be hoping here, because uh, white's uh, pressure along the G file appears to be very very strong. As I said in my intro, these are preliminary conclusions. I did not really have time or frankly even energy to. Uh, go in uh, too deep in positions like this for for a number of reasons. Uh, very important among those is that you don't really know which position to choose. There's so many positions during, uh, if you analyze a game like this, there are so many positions where you feel like you, you could continue clicking for half an hour because it's just so exciting to try and figure out what's what, but it's just not humanly possible to cover all of them. And the move that Levon made here is, is a very, very interesting attempt, but once again it feels like uh, his desire to play beautiful, exciting chess got, got a little bit the better of him, because I think normally he would just double on the g-file uh, to see what happens, but in his current mood he played uh, knight g5, which is uh, a very interesting idea, just simply threatening to take on g6 twice and uh, leaving more material unpreys. For instance, the rook on f3 is just left hanging. But objectively this move is uh, not really very good. And this is another one of those positions where the computer just goes g6 takes h5 and says this is now completely winning for, for black. But I'm not sure if Fabiano even considered that move to be honest. Uh, the machine, on the other hand, uh, sees quite clearly that after something like this, uh, black just has f7, f6, protecting against our beautiful threats along the b1, h7 diagonal. And black is uh, a tremendous amount of material up, and the knight on g5 is even stuck, so you probably will have to uh, give it up soon enough in this position. This is just completely lost, but even to start Calculating g6 takes h5 in this position would take uh, a huge effort and uh, both players obviously by this point, and I say obviously because of how complicated and non-standard previous play was, they were both in very very serious time trouble. <clears throat> Bishop takes f3 in this position is also not a poor move at all, but uh, I think both players by this point weren't really very interested in uh, picking up material because uh, they were uh, involved in a kind of a slugfest where each one is trying to hit, hit each other the hardest. And Fabiano replied to knight g5 with a move e6 c5, uh, 
uh, opening up diagonals for his bishops, hinting that if I v4 at some point might become a very serious threat. And this move uh, is also pretty decent, but uh, Levon's reply is absolutely on the money. Uh, I think this is the best move in the position, and against best play, it leads to, to endgames, which I suspect White probably will save. Uh, and this is a remarkably strong reply, considering how short on time uh, Lev was in this position. He played rook takes c6, b takes c6, and now knight takes f7. The idea occurred to me during the live broadcast. I believe I even mentioned it moments before it was played on the board. But I mentioned it as a kind of a curiosity, never for a second believing this could actually work. It's a lot more impressive to actually go for this uh, in a high-pressure tournament game, and this is what Lev did. Uh, rook takes f7, hg, and uh, in this position, uh, best play, as far as I could establish, is rook takes f4, sorry, rook takes f4, and I think in a press conference, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly what I read, in the press conference, Lev said that rook takes f4 was just winning, when uh, it, it really isn't, but it, it hinges on a very strange piece of calculation much later on, so it's not really surprising that uh, he did not figure out uh, everything absolutely correctly in this position. Takes, takes, queen takes d4. Uh, black plays queen e5, because if you play bishop e5, white has uh, uh, <clears throat> queen e4 in this position. Eventually, the, the pawns on g6 and h6 will cost black a great deal of material. Queen e5, g7, king g8, check, king h7. Check, queen takes h6, g8, takes, takes. And I assume when Lev said that he thought this was winning, he calculated that black actually picks this bishop up. But this position is not even better for black. This is just a draw, because uh, white has uh, good checks against all the black squares. Let's say king g7, you go uh, queen g4, check. And if king h8, you go queen h3, check. And queen h7 doesn't really help, because you always have queen c8, check. And uh, basically, Black's problem is that he can avoid the perpetual, but it comes at the cost of giving up the bishop on c7, and then the queen ending is just drawn for white. Uh, instead of uh, giving those two checks, the machine suggests that the somewhat, somewhat inhuman move, queen h8, actually picks up more pawns, and the main line goes bishop b3, discover check, queen takes b2, and... Uh, now we play something like bishop c2, and I think in, in, a, in a practical game, white has tremendous drawing chances in a position like this, uh, considering how weak the black king is, and maybe even some of those uh, opposite color bishop endings, two pawns down, might be drawn in some extreme cases. Uh, at this point, on very, very little time left, uh, Fabiano made uh, the most natural move in the position, rook f6, uh, hoping to stop white from playing g7 check because it creates this huge threat of rook takes h6 with check. And as a matter of fact, black uh, is not even at all better here. Um, and white has two ways of making a, an immediate uh, draw. Uh, playing the immediate queen h4 in this position appears to actually equalize, but this is much harder to understand. The, the lines go something like this. Um, queen e6 check. You can also start by playing uh, e5, e4, it leads to similar positions. So queen e6, check, f5, you play queen d6. White plays, uh, bishop e4 is, is an interesting opportunity. Uh, there's also simply king g2, you will see similar positions later in the variation. And despite being a full rook up, uh, black really isn't better at all, because this structure on the king side will eventually uh, be... Um, threatening enough that uh, black will only have enough counterplay uh, for perpetuals or other kinds of uh, draws. And the same applies to e4, bishop takes e4, queen e6 check. Once again, the threat of rook takes g6 forces white to go f5. Black goes queen d6. And uh, I should have mentioned that the whole point of playing queen e6 check and forcing white to go f4, f5 in, the, f5 in these positions is to secure the h7 square for the king on h8. So now g6, g7 is not an immediate threat and will not be an immediate threat for a while. 
But white just goes king g2. And once again, uh, black has a rook for one pawn. No, for two pawns, I apologize. But the pawns are so, so far advanced and white's control over the board after, let's say, something like rook e8 and you play bishop d3, it's an important move to, to notice in these types of positions. White just has tremendous counterplay and this construction with the bishop on d3, rook here and the queen on h4 controls pretty much all the checks that white can make in this, that black can make in this position. So white is not even remotely worse here, as it turns out. But the more forcing draw was missed on the next move by Livon, and it has the advantage of uh, being very, very concrete, and the variation he needed to calculate was incredibly direct. But it's not really very surprising that he didn't find it. He played g7 check, king g8, and in this position, queen h4 is an immediate draw. Uh, white wants to uh, give those checks from uh, g3 and c4 to the black king if it goes from uh, g8 to h7. For instance, let's say if you take on a 4 there is this simple perpetual. There's nothing better for white, but this is perfectly good enough. But I, th I assume that both players felt that e4 just wins on the spot here. And it would be completely winning, if not for the fact that the following long but absolutely straight variation makes a draw on the spot for white. h7, king g7, rook g3 only move, rook g8 only move, black takes twice, and here you go bishop c4 check, king g7 is actually an only move for black, queen g5, king h7, once again you will notice that because rook g6 is impossible of, because of queen takes e7, this is the only square you can go to, <clears throat> and this is a, a very beautiful perpetual check, but they really, uh, especially considering the time situation, I don't think anyone can blame Livon for not finding the idea in this position of giving up both of his beautiful pawns on h6 and g7 and also trading this rook, uh, rook away, leaving himself with only two pieces to secure enough counterplay. Because of all this, uh, and to sidestep the, uh, the fork, left started with bishop c4 check, and this is finally uh, a completely lost position, queen h4. And actually in this position many moves uh, uh, many moves win because uh, black has uh, ways to avoid the perpetual. For instance, if you play queen d6, bishop d3, e4, bishop e4, and king g8, it is very, very relevant that there is now no check from uh, this diagonal. And uh, the threat of rook takes h6 with check just uh, uh, more or less wins on the spot. But what Fabiano did is uh, perfectly good enough. He played e4. Rook g3 is really the only move that makes any sense, creating the threat of g8. And there's only one move for the for black that wins in this position, but it's it's a very direct move, and Fabiano spotted it. Bishop takes f4, uh, re-establishing the threat of rook takes h6. Uh, obviously, if you play rook takes h6 immediately, uh, g8, uh, rook g8, bishop takes g8 is... Uh, mating for white. But after bishop f4, the only move you can make is g8 check, takes, bishop takes g8, king h8, rook g7. And uh, a final uh, a final trick uh, for white here, uh, there's a number of moves that win, but it is still possible uh, to, to make a very, very large mistake. What appears to be a very natural move here, queen d6, actually loses on the spot because rook h7 check, king g8, queen g4 check, and now king h7, uh, queen g7 is made, and so is rook g6, uh, rook g7 check. This is a very important motif, and Lev actually, I, I believe, did say during the press conference that uh, there was uh, his uh, final hope and his uh, calculation when he went for this position. But uh, queen f8, the move that Fabi did, uh, made in this position, uh, secures the control over the g7 square, so the same tactics will never work because in this position black can just take this rook and the queen protects the g7 square. And suddenly in this position uh, there is just absolutely no defense against a very, very simple threat of rook takes h6. Uh, and uh, 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 in this position Livon resigned and uh, <laughs> that's the end of the game. Uh, an incredibly uh, interesting and uh, exciting game uh, made particularly exciting by 
uh, Levon's choice to play uh, g2, g4 in this position instead of the standard plans connected with knight g3. And uh, of course you can criticize some of the decisions taken by the players later in the game, but I'm not even sure about many of the conclusions I came to with the help of the computer analyzing, you know, in a, in a quiet studio where nobody is bothering me and there's not very much at stake. I can only imagine how difficult it is to play uh, a position like this in a tournament uh, of that importance. So, uh, well played by both of them and uh, an extremely exciting game, which, uh, the result of which means that uh, after the first half of the tournament, this is round 7 uh, of 14, uh, Fabiano Caruana is now leading the tournament on plus 3, 5 out of 7. Uh, Shahriyar Mamidyarov is half a point behind him on 4.5. And, and the rest of the field is either on 50% or below, including Livon himself, who with this loss goes to minus 2. And this really is a, is a disaster for him, obviously, uh, and for his uh, many fans and supporters. But... Uh, it's quite clear that he is uh, trying his hardest in, in every round to play the most fighting chess he knows. It's just seemingly not quite working for him. But you cannot really fault the effort or the intent uh, he demonstrates in, in every single round. I'll wrap this up on this note. Uh, stay tuned for our continued coverage of the Berlin Candidates 2018. We will be back uh, with round 8 of the tournament tomorrow at 3 p.m. Central European. I hope you enjoyed this somewhat rambling video. Uh, see you tomorrow, I guess. This has been Peter Svidler for Chess24.